for having me. Um, so as Peter already told you, I'm a wildlife photographer, um, which pretty much means I have the best job on earth in many ways. Um, in some ways, maybe not so great as Peter mentioned the financial side, but in terms of adventure and joy, I've got a pretty good gig with what I do. Um, I travel the world taking photos of animals. I do this for magazine publications and book projects, and my favorite projects are for in-depth stories where I spend time with one animal or one species, anywhere from a few days to a few weeks to a few months, and in the case of cheetahs, 18 months. So a lot of my time goes to spending long hours with my subjects and really creating in-depth work that maybe we haven't seen before very rare imagery. And it's having these special times with animals and long time with animals that really makes this possible. I make my living from a few different sources. As I mentioned, I do magazines, I do books. I also lead tours. As a wildlife photographer, you have to kind of have a lot of balls in the air. And you know whatever comes down is great and you're lucky. Some things work, some things don't. But there's no wildlife photography career where you can just do one thing anymore where you're photographing for one publication. You've got to have a lot of different projects going on. But the one commonality is that I focus on baby animals. So I specialize in documenting family life of wild animals. Um, and that is something that I was born passionate about, according to my mom. Um, she always says that this job, um, you didn't pick this job, it shows you. Ever since I can remember, this is all I wanted to do. I don't know what it's like to live life and not want to photograph animals. Um, I was definitely a strange kid. Um, I didn't quite fit in in school. I wasn't, um, wasn't exactly popular with the boys, super stylish, as you can see. Um, but I was passionate. I was madly passionate about animals, about nature. This is this looks somewhere really exotic, but it's actually a zoo. Um, but I am dressed for safari, just in case. Um, and I spent my life dreaming about places like the African savanna. Um, and I told my parents that I was going to go live in a tent in Africa, and I think they thought I would grow out of it. And I never did. Um, and so. I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in San Rafael. Um, and then I went to Boulder for a couple years and then finished my school in Santa Cruz. And Santa Cruz was a great place for me to start off as a young nature photographer. I did a lot of local work. Obviously, I didn't really have when I graduated college. You can't just graduate college and say, I'm going to be a wildlife photographer. It's a bit like saying, I'm going to be an actor or a musician. Um, you need a day job. So I worked at the Santa Cruz SPCA as the PR director, which basically meant I got to hang out with puppies and kittens all day, which was better than my previous job of waiting tables. So I was pretty happy about this. And I held this job for um, six years. And in that six year time, I managed to get my schedule to be four days a week. And then I would go out and shoot for, for three days a week. And I really, really worked on my portfolio mostly local at the time. As I started to work with local subjects, I started to realize how important that connection was with animals in terms of focusing on one animal in depth, sometimes one individual, but certainly one species, and saw the value in that. And I started producing material, again, mostly focused around baby animals. And I started to hear for the first time that you know, you can't make a career in focusing on baby animals. I mean, first of all, you can't be a wildlife photographer. That's just, you know, pie in the sky dream. But particularly when I threw in the baby animals, you know, people sort of poo pooed it. Baby animals are not something that um, people really sort of held in wide respect. It was sort of like, oh, that's for kids and, you know, you'll never make it. And, and um, so I heard that from the very beginning. Um, and, and honestly, I was so driven and so passionate about my subjects that I just didn't care. I just completely disregarded it. I almost like didn't even hear it. And, um, and that drive that, that you have to have that to make it in this industry, you have to be completely 100% driven. You need that tunnel vision. You need that ability to not 
pay attention to rejection and not pay attention to what people are saying, um, and, and that extreme dedication. Um, photographing wildlife is not always easy. It takes a lot, of, a lot of patience, which I'll talk about more in depth later, but it also um, takes a lot of skill and there's a lot of things that you wouldn't necessarily realize in it. Um, there's different ways of approaching different subjects. Some of the animals you have to hide from, so I, I started using blinds a lot, also called hides. Um, dressing from camo from head to toe for certain subjects. And um, being in a blind is really interesting. You, you, you sit in there all day. Sometimes you're in a like crunched up little position and you're waiting for something to happen. And sometimes it's hot and sweaty in there. Or it's muddy and it's, it's generally not a, a, a fun experience. So everybody has all these, these ideas of wildlife photography being super sexy. You get to go to all these places and gallivant around the world and you're with wild animals all the time. And the truth of the matter is, is you're doing stuff like this sitting in a blind, you know, hours and hours of boredom. I, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't admit that I get bored and waiting for something that may or may not happen after you spend a 13 hour day. And then if you actually think about like what happens in those 13 hours, you can't always, sometimes you can read a book, but sometimes, you know, in this case, it's too dark inside to read a book. So you sit in there and just try to get into this Zen space and Working with baby animals, there are particular, if you're at like a den site, for example, you can't cause a lot of disturbance. So often you just sort of go in really very quietly and slowly in the morning and then you pull out when the sun goes down and you don't go in and out. There's no like going in and out to, to pee privilege. So you, um, you do things like carry around a big, huge red water bottle that is your pee bottle that is a nice, color that you could never mistake as your water. And I mean, this is your life. This is, this is what you're doing. I mean, you make that mistake once, you accidentally drink out of it once, you never do it again. You cover things with stickers, do not drink, various things that you just don't think about as, as life as a wildlife photographer. Um, and some of these places that you go are sort of like these legendary, when I first went up to Alaska and had the ability to travel, you start, you read about working with these dangerous animals on foot and, you know, grizzly bears can kill you and they charge and, um, and then you start sort of realizing that, yeah, it, it, animals like this can be dangerous, but a lot of that is sort of this almost urban legend, mythical folklore. Working with grizzly bears has actually been some of the most peaceful experiences I've had working with any subject. Um, and I learned this really early on. And grizzly bears were my first sort of large carnivore working around getting to, to know how to work with them. And I was with a bear guide who taught me a lot. He was a bear hunter. And um, we carried bear spray at the time. And what I realized is, is that knowing animal behavior is 90% of this job. And I, this was good for me because it was always 90% of my interest. The photography kind of came second. It was the animals that came first. But knowing that actually part of the skill or the majority of the skill is knowing what these animals might do in terms of keeping you safe, but also in terms of what they might do in, in getting the right photo the next time, anticipating what they're going to do next. So, you know, historically you'd think, okay, working with mom and, and cubs, you know, with grizzly bears is something that is, is quite dangerous. Um, but really, if you know their behavior, you keep your distance, you're respectfully, and you know signs to watch for. Um, I use a lot of long lenses. It can be an incredibly peaceful experience where you're not in danger and they're not stressed. And that's one of the most important things when I work, particularly since I work with baby animals, is not stressing my subjects out because obviously this is a really tender, sensitive situation when you're working with animals and they're young. And some of these, um, these young animals that grow up around people, this is a, a sub-adult grizzly bear that grew up around people. And we have various strategies when working with grizzly bears if they get too curious. So you have bear spray around your belt, but you don't want to use the bear spray unless you absolutely have to. So the bears will come up and get curious about you. And they'll kind of like try to sniff your backpack or whatever they want to do. 
And you obviously will slowly back away and try, if you're with other people, you try to sort of stay together as a group. But, and then, you know, sometimes the bears that have grown up around people, they're not really easily faced. So you might do something like shake a rain jacket at them, which makes a loud noise, and then they usually run away. Or um, in this bear's case, he had hurt a lot of rain jackets. He was not faced by rain jackets at all. So he just kept coming and coming and coming. And then finally, I just took my baseball cap off my head and bonked him on the nose with it. And that was the end of that. So, you know, it, a baseball hat is what, what it takes for this, you know, large and dang dangerous carnivore to, um, to go running away. So some of, some of the job has really been dispelling a lot of those myths. And I'm not saying that these aren't dangerous animals, but there are very peaceful ways of working with them and coexisting. Um, one of the other exotic places I got to go was the Arctic. Um, this is my first experience with really extreme conditions. I went up to document a climate change study. And part of that was actually um, the scientists were darting mothers and cubs as they came out of their den. Um, and so, you know, the scientist had a cub that was getting a little too cold. It was tranquilized and his body temperature was dropping. And he's like, are you okay with warming him up? I'm like, sure, I'm not gonna say no to that. Um, I had a job on a ship in Antarctica. Um, I worked on a staff for two expeditions. Um, and that was, you know, a, a little bit of a, it was a fun job, it didn't pay well, but I got to photograph penguins on my off time and then was assisting with Zodiac loading and unloading on, on my work time. Um, but for me, as a, as a young wildlife photographer starting out, it was a job that was a dream job because I had a paid trip to Antarctica and I got to photograph animals. Um, I was already selling pictures at this point and I had already established a relationship with an agent. And when I got home from that, my agent sold one of my photos to the cover of Time. And it was a really interesting point in my career. Two things happened. One, um, I had, I, I knew that the job didn't pay that well. At the time, I was $50,000 in credit card debt. Um, and that was from just like trying to get started. There was, there was no, you know, you can't get a business loan as a wildlife photographer and there was no family money. So credit cards to me were worth gold. And um, so I put everything on a credit card to buy all the gear and, and do some of the first travel that I did. So I knew that this was not a high paying job, but I hadn't really realized how bad it actually was. And so when I got this message from my agent that this had sold, I thought, you know, I'm going to be rich. This is amazing. Cover of time, worldwide rights. I'm going to be a rich girl. And I had all these numbers in my head. And in the end, it was $1,500 split between the two of us. Um, and that was a major eye opener for me. Um, and then the other eye opener that came with the time cover as well was you know, you, you get the cover of time. And so a lot of people start talking about, you know, okay, well, the photographer has arrived, you know, they've had the cover of time. And for me, it was the first time I really realized I obviously being a woman in a male dominated field, I had, I had been a minority and I had experienced some of the challenges faced with that. Um, but this is when I really started to hear discussions about me said in front of me of, you know, she'll be barefoot and pregnant in five years, or she's not gonna last, she'll have kids. Um, you know, she's a woman, she's not gonna go to tough places. Um, and, and it really, this, the conversations after this time cover came out were quite eye-opening for me in terms of exactly what an old boys club I was dealing with. So I, my big break came at a really interesting point in my life I had um, been saving money instead of paying off my credit card debt, which I should have been. I was saving money to um, do a dream project, which would, was to go to Africa and photograph a cheetah cub family. And I wanted to follow cubs that were out of the nest like six weeks old or so. And I'd put money aside for that and I had made some relationships with people in Africa about certain places where cheetahs were found. And I had convinced these lodge owners to let me know when there was a litter of cheetah cubs out. And it had been a couple years since I had had 
any correspondence with them. And at the time, I was still working my SPCA job. I was part-time, but I was, I was still working it. And I was feeling a little demoralized about my career and, and whether or not it was going to actually work for me. And there were other challenges in my life as well. I was, I think everyone, every woman at some point has a bad boyfriend, and this was my time to have a bad boyfriend. I had this guy for seven years that I shouldn't have been with, and, um, and life just was not really going well. And Bing comes into my inbox an email saying, there's cheetah cubs, come to the Serengeti now. And um, I decided overnight to radically change my life. So I dumped the boyfriend, I drained the savings account, I put everything in storage, and I picked up and I went to Africa. And I thought I'd stay two years and I wound up staying, or sorry, I thought I'd stay two months and I wound up staying three years. And it radically changed my life. Um, the, I wound up spending 18 months working with cheetahs, five different families. This is a family I worked with when um, I actually found the mom when she was pregnant and um, worked with these guys. They're about four days old. And I started getting imagery that was really unique. And what I would do in order to get this imagery is I would go out and I would find my cheetah family in the morning and I would stay with them all day long until sunset. And then I had one of those old fashioned GPS point devices, not like you know the Garmin where it tells you like, turn right to go to the cheetahs. There wasn't anything like that, but I would plot in points at the end of the day. And so the next day I would go back and try to find them. And I did this over and over again every day. And I got to know quite a few different females very well. And as a result, their cubs grew up around me um, and started you know, doing things like playing on my car, on the tire. And then um, I had a cheetah jump on the hood of my car. Um, this is a cub that sort of grew up around me. And then he eventually progressed to the point where he would stick his head in, in my window that would, was open. And cheetahs are very docile. They're not like lions or leopards where they're going to full on attack you so you don't have to be terrified when this happens. But um, you know, stuck his head in the window and pawed my shoulder to try to get me to engage and play. And um, you know, I, of course, as a wildlife photographer, we don't touch. It's not something that we do. It's, it's a real ethical no-no. So I didn't play back as much as I wanted to. I didn't play back. Or I would just be sitting there in my car, and he'd be on the roof, and his tail would drop down and like graze my neck. And, it was quite a heavenly experience. Um, and then followed the moms when they went out hunting. Um, this is a shot that was incredibly difficult for me to get. I think I tried for about 12 days or so. And she finally had um, a hunt that was in the open and in the in a right situation for photography. Um, and, and just being able to capture these animals um, at such high speeds is is something that's challenging, but also really exhilarating watching a cheetah move. And you can see here in her movement, her tail is like a rudder, and she's using it to turn as this gazelle zigzags and tries to escape from her. Um, so just really incredibly special times with, with my cheetah families. And then I found myself at the end of those 18 months, I found myself thinking, well, I'm, I'm in the Maasai Mara, which is one of the wildlife meccas. Um, and so I thought, well, turn my attention to the 1.8 million wildebeest that were pouring in. And they do the great migration, worked with leopard, and then spent a few months working with a lion pride. This is one of my top selling images. This is a, a male um, meeting his cub for the first time. And again, this went back to uh, knowing wildlife behavior, knowing what might happen next. So. I had done a lot of research. I had talked to a lot of different biologists. And I knew that when I found the cubs, they were about two weeks old. And I knew that at some point, mom would take them out. It would, it would be more like mom couldn't keep them in. And they'd be so rowdy, they'd come out. She couldn't do anything about it. And they would meet the rest of the pride. And that would be when they met dad. So I anticipated this moment and just hoped that it would happen and in a good situation for photography. And on a day when I could find them, because um, you know, lots of times I would go out looking for my subjects and not be able to find them and look all day and have no success. So luck plays a huge part in it. Anticipation plays a huge part, but luck as well. 
And then that patience game of um, a lot of the big cats that I work with aren't very shy because they're used to people on safari following them around. But when you start working with some of the nondescript animals like these jackals, you start following them and they're like, whoa, you're supposed to ignore me. What's going on? And they don't like it one bit. So for this family, it took 17 days to habituate them. And what that means is basically to get them so that they're not shy anymore. And it's so 17 days until I got my first photo. And that's just moving my Jeep a little bit closer to them every day. A lot of people ask what my life was like living in the Mara. And this is the car that I drove, is a little Suzuki. When I first got there, I had a Land Cruiser. And the Land Cruiser is a lot. It's a lot to handle. It's a lot on my own with my physique. Um, to even just you know change the tire. I mean, you grew up in Marin and you call it AAA. There's no tri there's no AAA out there. So um, you've got to do everything on your own. So this was a car that I could that I could handle doing some small repairs on, and also a great car for driving around, following wildlife because I could get into little places as well. People tease me because it was like a toy car, but it served me very well. And then my camp. Um, this is my very fancy bush shower. Um, at first, I just had the, the rubber bucket and tied it up in the trees, and then I had my camp guy make me this. I did hire a um, security guard for camp, um, and he became sort of my camp guy and helped me with stuff around. Um, and then I had this tent for three years. Um, so it's bigger than the kind of tent you'd go to Yosemite in, um, but um, you know, still pretty basic. There was a cot inside, cot inside, and then I had the basin to wash with um, as well. No toilet. Living without a toilet for three years is quite an experience. Um, and then I had no power for the first year and a half. I ran everything off my car batteries, and then after a year and a half, I got solar panels put in. So I don't know if you noticed in the previous shot, but there's a little friend up in front. But while I was working in the Masai Mara, the rangers um, got to know me. And they asked me if I would take care of an orphan serval kitten named Moto. Um, I named him Moto, which means fire. And um, I was pretty isolated and kind of lonely in camp. So I, I loved the idea of having a little something, a little being to, to love and take care of. So um, I said yes, and the intent was always to return him to the wild. Um, but he was two weeks old, so he needed a lot of time with a mom of sorts. Um, so when I first got him, he was not doing well. He was emaciated, and he was not feeding very well. And a rehabber had told me that I just needed to hang out with him in bed. And I couldn't. At the time, I was working on my hyena den, and I was too busy, I couldn't just hang out in bed for days with him. So I sewed little kangaroo pouches into shirts and um, tucked him inside and buttoned him up. And I would take him in my Jeep every day and we'd go out to the hyena den and he loved it in the pouch. He was super happy in there. Um, he would just snooze away in the pouch. He peed on me a lot in there, but <laughs> other than that, it worked out really well. And then he bonded with me from being so close to me for days and hearing my heartbeat and feeling my skin then he started feeding very well. He also loved being brushed with an old toothbrush that I had around. So, and if you think about it, it was perfect. It was, you know, the exact shape and size and texture as mom's tongue would have been. He, he absolutely could not get enough of this. So I did this every day. And then, um, and then the really tough part came where I had to teach him how to kill rats. And that one was rough. So I started, I went, I took him from milk formula to chicken smoothies. So I actually got a blender and started like blending up chicken breast with the milk. But then I had to get him onto something. It's not like he'd find raw chicken breast around in the Mara. So I had to get him onto something natural. So I said to the rangers, I put up like a bounty on, on rats and said, you know, if you can bring me a dead rat, the only rule was no poison was allowed, then I'll, you know, give you a certain amount of money. So like the day I put the bounty up, the next day I had like seven dead rats with people's names all written out of like who I owed money to. And, um, 
And then it got, then the stakes got higher because he, he immediately got the hang of like what a rat, do, like what the taste is and he got the taste for it, but he didn't know quite what to do with them in terms of killing them. And what mom would do is she would take something maimed or crippled back to the nest for them or take them out to something maimed or crippled. And so I knew I had to give him something maimed or crippled. So it sounds really horrible, but I had to say, well, you know, I'll give you double the amount of money if you send, if you give me a crippled rat. So I got these brown bags with, with crippled rats inside. And the first crippled rat I gave him, it took him um, 45 minutes to kill it. And he killed it by just like beating it to death on the, on the floor of my tent. It was like a crime scene. There was blood everywhere. It was terrible. But he eventually got the hang of it and became the most amazing rat hunter. Um, and he thrived and he did very well. He, to the, to the day that he left, he actually loved being in my car. I think it's from all the time in the pouch. There were no fences in my camp, so he was seeing all those wild animals around. But um, he loved, for some reason, he loved looking at the animals through the window. So he'd always try to hop in my car whenever he could to go out on a game drive with me. So sometimes I would let him. He did go back to the wild. He just disappeared one night. He used to, by the time he left, he was pretty feisty and had reached sexual maturity and was very aggressive. But he still was coming in every night and he would like cuddle up to me and purr and lick me for a few minutes every night and then he'd go off hunting again. I left the zip open um, in the tent so it was like a cat door. It was actually worked as like a snake door too, unfortunately. And he was supposed to be good at catching snakes but he wound up being a miserable snake hunter. So. That didn't work out so well, but he would just leave, come back as he pleased. And then one night he didn't come and I just kind of thought the worst, but I saw him a week later and he was absolutely fine. So he just returned to the wild, which is exactly what I wanted him to. I don't know what I thought, like maybe there'd be some like dramatic goodbye. Um, I'd never done anything like this before. I was, <laughs> grew up with puppies and kittens, you know, and um, you know, when they leave, you usually say goodbye, like you put them to sleep and you say goodbye. I thought there'd be like, goodbye, good luck, but None of that, um, but it, I was very happy that he went to the wild. That was the, the point the whole time. So um, I'm not gonna get too doom and gloom, but one of the things um, that this experience also gave me was my first experience with conservation and conservation photography. So one of the things that I realized is that there was poaching going on absolutely everywhere where I had been, but I had never seen any signs of it because as, as a, sort of tourist you don't, but then I would come back and talk to the rangers and they'd talk about catching, you know, eight poachers on Ingrary Hill and I'm like, well, wait a minute, I was on Ingrary Hill yesterday. And, and so I started to sort of marvel at how uh, invisible poaching was and, and I started to ask, could I come with you on some of the anti-poaching jobs? And of course, first the answer was no. Again, that went back to being a woman, that it wasn't safe to be a woman. And you know, the, the nice thing about Africans and, and their sexism is that they're pretty point blank. They don't try to hide it. They're like, no, it's because you're a woman and there's no place for you. Whereas in our culture, we try to hide it a little bit more, but they don't. They just come right out with it and they're like, no. But after two years, I convinced them to allow me to come and they did. So I spent three weeks shadowing these guys and they, we go out on these, um, some of them were just patrols, patrolling for snares. And then others were a little more exciting than that and they were actual ambushes. So we would go and we would find the meat hanging in a camp where the guys were sort of packing it in and out, coming back and forth. They had to walk two days with the meat. So we'd see where meat was hanging and drying in the trees and you'd know they were gonna come back. So we'd lay in the grass and wait all night. And there were some times when I'd go out with them and nothing exciting would happen. You'd just lay there all night and like a hyena would chew on your shoe or something and that was like the only excitement. Guys never came. And then there were other nights where stuff would happen. So um, with these raids, um, the most, most of what these guys were doing is commercial meat poaching. And it was going at a, at a really rapid rate. So they estimated that year 180,000 wildebeest have been poached in the Serengeti Mara ecosystem. And, then, and that year, it was the total population was 1.8 million. So in terms of the sustainability of the trade and, and, the, and how um, the volume that we were dealing with, it was, it was pretty out of control. Um, 
a lot of it was going on at night. And so the night ambushes that would happen, it was really difficult. The guys didn't have night vision equipment. They had a lot of them. There were some AK-47s in the mix, but a lot of them just had old rifles that they hadn't shot in like 10 years. Um, very underfunded. They had a couple handcuffs. The rest of them used some twine that they put guys together with. On this raid, there were 52 poachers that night, and we had 40 guys on foot and six vehicles. And you know, the poachers came in. We watched them coming down from the escarpment for a couple hours, and then they came in, and all hell broke loose. People were running everywhere, chaos, and in the end, 12 were captured. So it's a very challenging thing, and it's also a very demoralizing thing for the for the rangers themselves to hear. You know, they were out 52 poachers, and they got 12. It's not exactly a, a success rate that they could be proud of. There were days when we would go around collecting snares, and there would be at the end of the day, over 300 snares. So huge, huge volume. So after my time in the Mara, I started doing a lot of work in jungles with apes. And um, apes are really fun. They're, they're pretty exciting to work with. Um, I always sort of describe chimpanzees as like schizophrenic. They're like one second, they're like calm, and then the next second, they're just completely psycho. And the, um, the alpha males are the worst at it, unfortunately. And I was warned, so this, this guy, his name is Kakama. And I was warned when I started working in this area that Kakama might um, give me a little grief when he met me. And I didn't really know exactly what that looked like. But the Ugandan research assistants had said, you know, if he charges you, um, you need to kick at him. And then he'll stop. And so trying to describe what it's like to be charged by a chimpanzee is really difficult. They, um, when they start charging, they get into this. First of all, they get bipedal. And second of all, their hair stands up on end and it's piloerect. And it looks like they've been electrocuted. And it's from all the aggressive hormone that's just pumping through them. And then they take branches with them, usually as they're running. So they're like carrying the forest with them. They throw rocks often and they beat the ground. And, um, and I tell you, when, when a chimp like this comes straight at you, um, you would have to be like superhuman to be able to kick at it. I, I could not kick at him when he did this. And so as a result of me not kicking, which everybody found hilarious except me, is Kakama gave me a bit of a slap as he went by, he just went whack and slapped me on the hip and then kept going, which was quite alarming. Um, it didn't really hurt, but it was pretty terrifying. And then um, all the guys thought it was hilarious. The, the head researcher wasn't so excited about it, the guy from Harvard, because obviously you don't want to have any physical contact. Um, aggression tends to build in chimpanzee society. So it wasn't the greatest thing that happened. but. Um, it was terrifying, to say the least. Um, so Kakama, who's like this big, huge, brutal alpha male, is the polar opposite of this guy. This is Lanjo. And when I first entered this field, um, I had heard people talk about animal crushes. And I had thought, you know, these people are so bushed out. They have spent way too much time with animals <laughs> until I developed my first animal crush, which is with Lanjo. And Lonjo like stole my heart immediately. He's, I mean, you have to admit, he's, he's a pretty sexy looking chimp. And he <laughs> also, he's very charming. He's grown up around people. So he has absolutely no fear of people. And he likes to look at you with these gazing eyes. And then he does this thing with, where he pulls, he puts his arm out and he puts out his palm. And it's, it's like grooming solicitation. It's what chimpanzees when they say to each other, groom me. Um, so he would come up to me and do this. And of course, you know, we don't touch, we can't do this, but I desperately wanted to groom Lonjo. And there was another American research student there at the time, my friend Jess. And um, so one day I, I confessed um, my crush for Lonjo and she's like, oh my God, me too. He's such a good looking chimp. And so then after that, we kept like, I saw Lonjo and I was like, you did not. Like, so we had this thing going about Lonjo, but um, you animals do get under your skin sometimes. Lonjo's one of them that did. Um, 
So then I moved on to photographing orangutans, and this is something that is um, very close to my heart. Orangutans, as many of you probably know, are in peril from palm oil, which is in a lot of Western products that we use, food products and toiletries. And so I set off on a quest to photograph an orangutan rescue. And um, the orangutans that we found that needed to be rescued um, were in a patch of land that was fragmented and was surrounded by clear cut. And so there was no way these orangutans could live on it. Um, and I went out with these guys. This was the rescue team that I went out with. Um, and we drove into the village. They dropped me off at um, a little guest house where they thought I'd be more comfortable staying. They went into the village to stay at somebody's house. And at 10 o'clock at night, one of them came back looking absolutely terrified, saying they were fleeing because they had gotten death threats and that I had to hide there because it wasn't safe for me to leave with them and that they didn't think anyone knew I was associated with them, but I shouldn't leave my room. And um, they would send an unmarked car for me the next morning. So it was quite an eye-opening experience in terms of what these guys are dealing with. Um, and you know, I'm sitting there having to like text my fiance saying, you know, the number for the State Department and my passport copies are on the desk and blah, blah, blah. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Nothing happened, everything was fine. They sent an unmarked car. I got out of the village without any problems. Um, but the palm oil industry is something that is, is absolutely, it's like big tobacco or a big oil in this country. It's quite corrupt and it's quite scary for the locals that have to deal with it. So we moved to another village, stayed in um, an Islamic community. And for me, um, I was with those 12 guys. And what was great is the Islamic faith is obviously very modest. So because I was a woman, they gave me the bedroom, which is great, except there's no bed. Um, and, but it was super comfortable nonetheless. Um, and I stayed in this house. The bathing was not ideal the bathroom for, sh for showering and whatnot wasn't great. Um, but this is often the conditions that we're in as wildlife photographers, we're either you know, in the bush or we're often in villages that are incredibly impoverished and we don't complain and we're just really grateful about everything that we're given. Um, particularly these guys, because these guys are risking their lives. Um, a lot of them are informants and they're actually snitching out people in their community. Um, about um, these orangutans being sold. So one of the things that happens with orangutans that are on palm oil plantations is that the babies are sold on the black market as pets and there's a lot of money involved in this. So the informants are usually snitching them out when they know a baby's in, in somebody's house that's gonna be sold. So we did rescue an orangutan on this, um, this parceled um, piece of forest and um, took her to a um, national park where she could live safely and have enough food. The big thing about being on a palm oil plantation is that they can't survive. They can't, orangutans can't live off palm. Um, and so they slowly starve to death if they're not shot by the palm oil plantation workers. So she was released. So that was um, a happy story. And then I have worked a lot with some, some uh, much lighter hearted, goofy animals. Um, sloths are one of my favorites I've spent um, close to eight years working on sloths and um, recently did a sloth book. And one of the things that we, the sloth researcher and I really wanted to document is these, are these swimming sloths um, that live on an island off of Panama, about three hours offshore. And um, it was quite an adventure going to photograph them. And I had never done any underwater photography before, so I was pretty intimidated by this whole thing. I'd never used an under, underwater housing. And so photographers, like, like any other field, when you don't know how to do something, you, do, you practice. So this is the, the pool in my backyard. Um, and this teddy bear has been various animals for me. He's posed as pangolins in trees. He's posed as koala joeys getting a surgery in a hospital, just trying to figure out techniques of how I would shoot something. So I stuck some floaties on this teddy bear um, in order to figure out how I was going to shoot um, the cover of our book. And then there is India. And India was um, a project that what for me took two and a half years of negotiating with 
Indian National Parks and the government, and that was to try to photograph a wild tiger den. And I had one huge disadvantage, and that was being a woman. And India is, is one of the worst places that I've worked in, in terms of being a woman. And it is, um, I'm very careful when I travel to other cultures, I always dress according to the way I should be dressed and I act the way I should be acting. Um, if you're a woman traveling alone, I think that there's no other way to do it. Um, but it was quite difficult for me because I just was not getting any headway. And then um, one of my closest Indian friends said to me, you just need to hire a male project manager and stop trying to go to the meetings yourself and just have him do everything for you. And that solved absolutely everything. It's, it's one of the few places um, where I've actually gone into government meetings and I've been told that I can't go into the meeting because I'm a woman. And it was a government official that told me that. Um, so it's a challenging environment for that respect. I absolutely love the Indian culture. I love the Indian people. And I loved working with my Indian tiger den. So this was in a place called Bend of Gar National Park. And um, this was a, a very special project for me, not just in terms of how rare it is to get permission to work with a wild tiger den, but the fact that this female was super relaxed and eventually her cubs also accepted me as well. The, this is the natal den where she gave birth. Um, so you can see in the next image, that's her going back up into it. She stayed in her natal den for about the first month and then moved um, her cubs to an even better place for photography. And this shot was really interesting because she had moved them um, to a place that was quite high actually. It was like a cave and she liked to lay out on the front of the cave area. And in order to get the shot, I had to, I was working on elephant. When you work with tigers, you're on elephant back usually in India. And there's a, a long history of, of good relationship between elephant and tigers in, in the national parks and the tiger reserves. And so I'm on this elephant back and, um, and so I, I had to stand up in order to get the shot. And my elephant, um, Mahout Bura, is um, holding on to my legs. And he's like, please don't fall. Please don't fall. Please don't fall. Um, and I stood there and, and was able to get these um, photos that kind of gave you that feeling of being in the den. And that was just because mom liked to cool off up front. So again, luck playing a huge part of it as well. And then I um, did a lot of work on, on the cubs as, as they grew up. So one of the things that I'd just like to end on, um, I know I've talked a couple times about being a woman in this field, but it's being a minority in the field has been something that's incredibly challenging. And it's slowly changing. There are more and more young women getting into nature photography than there used to be. When I entered, it was very much an old boys club. It still very much is. There's still a lot of sexism in the field. There's a lot of sexual harassment as well. But um, things are changing. And um, I decided um, two years ago to start my own non nonprofit. So I started something called Girls Who Click. And it's dedicated to trying to encourage young women to enter the field of nature photography, um, either as a profession or as a hobby um, or as a part of another job, but just trying to get girls into this and get them outside with a camera. And that's been incredibly rewarding working with the girls. Um, we provide free workshops for teen girls, and then we have most, a lot of the top names in nature photography that our women are working as instructors. So it's something that is incredibly close to my heart that I'm very proud of. And that's called Girls Who Click. And that is it. That's, that's all I've got for you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, uh, I'm from India, and it's incredibly disappointing to hear that experience. Sorry. Apologies <laughs> on behalf of my countrymen and women. Um, if it makes you feel any better, I have tried getting permission to uh, use a rover to take photographs, and I've never gotten permission so far, yeah. even being a man yeah. in, in, the, in this. Um, the question I had was, from a conservation perspective, increasingly many more people are visiting national parks, and they're taking pictures of wild animals. Yeah. So there's a lot more information 
uh, in social media yeah. a lot more images and pictures so people kind of tend to lose a uh, perspective that there is extreme threat and danger uh, for some of these animals like tigers for example uh, today uh, you go to ranthambore or bandavgad and you spend two or three safaris or you go two or three safaris into the forest so guarantee that you will definitely see a tiger and many of them carry good equipment and they shoot pictures but the truth is there are only about 2700 tigers in the country and yeah. it's the largest tiger population in the world yeah uh, there is so much images out there people kind of don't have that perception that this resource this natural history is pretty much under severe threat yeah. and they need to do something about it yeah. what is your perspective on that i think i mean it's that's definitely one way to look at it um the other way so first of all i think there's a lot of validity in that and what i would say is a lot of this is how you use the pictures and one of the things with girls who click and also the way i operate is not just collecting pretty pictures and using these pictures for conservation so i do a tremendous amount of work with conservation organizations in raising money um and also awareness and so trying to use your pictures to elevate awareness rather than just let's just say you're posting these photos on social media rather than just posting a pretty photo of a tiger trying to also post at, maybe not every time but at least sometimes every once in a while post some really critical information about how many tigers there are left and also what i try to do is when i do post about conservation i try to tell people what they can do because otherwise people wind up feeling a little bit helpless it's very easy right now in this climate to feel helpless about a lot of different things that are going on so giving people something to do some direct action they can take and your photos can actually utilize they can bring that home even more than if you posted that let's think of posting that without an image right not that many people would see it because it's just text but if you post that with a pretty photo it gets shared and it gets shared again so i think a lot of it is how you use the photos but that's one of the things that i really am trying to teach the girls and girls who click is that this is not about just collecting pretty pictures this is about doing something good with your photos that's going to benefit the world and the animals that are in it So yeah I mean that 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 is a fair point. We see that also a lot you're absolutely right about tigers but we also see that with lions. People they didn't realize until, you know, 10 years ago it kind of came as a huge shock to the world that lion numbers have dramatically plummeted because people when they go on safari they see lions everywhere. But what they don't realize is that outside of the national parks lions are almost non-existent. and it's only in those little pockets so you get this false impression that africa's teeming with lions when you go over there on safari and and you would get that impression with the tigers as well so again i think it goes back to how you use the images yeah thank you thank you so much for coming here today um so kind of just not even to reframe that but kind of um build on that last question there so um a, a, in addition to just the awareness perspective and i guess desensitizing desensitizing it um from other people or them feeling it's not as though it's uh I guess as big of an issue you just mentioned um the tourism in the parks in Africa and what not do you kind of feel that because of this awareness and now kind of a uh uh more of a movement to kind of go and visit those in person that you're seeing kind of an encroachment on the actual habitats themselves I actually went on safari like a few years ago and noticed I mean just the sheer number of cars and the difficulties it kind of causes for the lions themselves and if they're all concentrated in that area do you see that kind of this awareness is actually might backfire in the sense that all this tourism there is going to continue to destabilize their environment. Yeah, you know, that's a real catch 22. Um I definitely witnessed that firsthand and continue to witness that all over the world. You see tourists um irresponsible tourism, not just tourists behaving badly, but the infrastructure that's set up for tourism not being ideal or being too crowded or not being green. And It, it that is a problem the flip side of it is that if we if we cut off areas to tourism or if there aren't enough people seeing them we as human beings tend to not care about something unless we can enjoy it you know that's why wilderness areas in this country haven't really ever worked you know wilderness areas are a great idea in concept there's no roads going through them um the problem is is people can't enjoy them people tend to forget they exist and they don't care about them whereas you know a threat happens in Yellowstone the whole world cares because it's so many people have been there and they care about it so 
It is, I think, a real catch-22. The answer involved is obviously, it's a no-brainer, is controlling the tourism and controlling the numbers. And that's a huge problem. It's one of the biggest things right now with Jaguar tourism in Brazil, a place where I used to take people when I first started going, we'd have three or four boats around a Jaguar sighting maximum. And last time I went, there were 30. And so that kind of uncontrolled growth is, is going to kill it for everybody. It's not good for the tigers and it's terrible for the tourism. So I think a lot of is, it about, is about controlling it. But the problem comes is that you have these economies and these local areas that are so impoverished that everybody wants to get in on it, rightfully so, but it's very difficult to control that growth. It, takes, it has to come from a government level and a lot of these governments are just not willing to do that. So Botswana is kind of an interesting example of controlled tourism. However, that's only available for the elite and for the wealthy. So there's kind of catch-22s in all of it, but I think that's a, a really fair point. But we have to control it. Yeah. Whether it's you know, photography or art or uh, writing, some sort of create, creative endeavor, um, developing your creative talent, there is that um, developing your, your personal style. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe how other photographers have either influenced you or uh, changed your, your, your own style or you, you know, perhaps um, saw what they were doing and tried to um, kind of build on that or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, however that might be that uh, helped you kind of develop your own creative style. Yeah. So uh, when I was little, I, I grew up watching nature documentaries and also reading magazines, but I really loved nature documentaries. And when I was in college, I worked, um, I did a semester abroad program and I had the ability to work with a film crew from the BBC for about two weeks as a sort of apprentice of sorts. And they allowed me to go back and work with them on two occasions. And I learned a tremendous amount from them, particularly about wildlife behavior and about respecting animals and about working with individuals and developing relationships of trust between yourself and the animal, but also habituating animals that are shy. And I took from that a huge, a huge amount of my work is based on the way a cameraman operates versus a stills photographer. In fact, a lot of people have told me, God, you, you work a lot more like a, a film crew would than, than a stills photographer, just in terms of the sheer amount of time that I take with my subjects and also um, how in depth and how much care I take in not offending my, my animal subjects or not threatening their trust. So cameramen have been hugely influential. I, I wish all stills photographers had spent some time with cameramen because cameramen, for the most part, are really, they're in the trenches more than still photographers in terms of how much time they have to spend waiting for a shot and um, how much they have to get into the animal's head. Um, but that's also something that I'm most interested in. So most of my early people that I admired, with the exception, there's, um, there's a, a female a uh, nature photographer that I admired growing up named Tui DeRoy, who is um, a huge mentor of mine to this day and is someone that I'm privileged to call a friend. And she entered the industry when there were like almost no women. Um, and she stepped foot very bravely into a world where um, women were really not welcome at all. And I, and I really admire her for it. So I grew up admiring her stuff as well. Going back a little bit to the conservation issues, mm -hmm. um, you've had a lot of contact with local people who seem to really care about these issues, whether it be rangers or people who are out there to protect the orangutans near the palm oil plantations. And could you talk more about what drives them? Is it government initiatives that pay those people as a way to basically help protect the preserves or is it just their interactions with the animals that they feel like um, compelled to protect them just to get a sense of like what 
what works and what doesn't at like the local level? I think it depends. I mean, it depends on the conservation initiative. I can think of ones that I've worked on where it has not been driven by money at all and the guys are just totally in love with the wildlife and care passionately about what they're doing. And then I can think of others where it's like they're just going through it blind and they just want the money. Um, and they're doing maybe doing a good job, but the passion's not there. So it's, um, it's all across the board. I think that um, any program, not any, but many programs that do bring in together money and conservation, they work because local communities need the money in many of these countries. Um, and the biggest problems, like, like the poachers that I showed you photos of, those are Wakuria people in the Serengeti National Park. And one of the reasons why they're poaching in the Serengeti National Park is because they used to live in the Serengeti National Park. They were hunters and gatherers and they got kicked out by the government when it was made a national park. And they're not employed by the national park. The national park employs people from the cities instead of employing local Wakuria people. So they have absolutely no economic benefit from the park at all. So they go into the park to get what's you know sort of rightfully theirs. And um, there's no qualms about that because they're not getting any benefit. So why not? So the, the conservation programs that employ people and give them a livelihood, I think for the most part really do work. I know there's some situations where money doesn't work in conservation, but I think they're few and far between. Um, I didn't quite catch if you like writing articles to go with your photographs or how, like, do you sometimes, how you display the photographs or you sometimes try and find a reporter to go work on it with you or, or um, just what do you prefer? You think you'll be more doing more writing with the photographs? Um, so I don't like writing. Um, I, I grew up with two parents that were journalists. They were writers and I don't know, maybe that gave me a distaste for it, but I was just not in a terrible way. I mean, just that, you know, they were writing a lot, particularly my father, but um, I, writing is something I've never enjoyed and it's never come easily to me. It's something that, you know, usually I, I dread it and put it on the back burner. Um, I write for children's books. That's, that's very different. It has been challenging, um, for sure. Writing for a three-year-old is not easy, especially when you've never had a three-year-old. But um, in terms of writing for adults, it's just not something that interests me. The other thing is, too, I know a few writers. And also, a lot of the magazines I work with use writers of their own, whether they're freelance or staff. So what I generally do when I pitch a feature to somebody is I pitch story ideas with it. To, to just make it a prettier package for them so that the editors don't have to do as much research on their end. And very often they go with one of the points that I pitch and they'll assign a writer to it. And then the writer almost always gets in touch with me, which is very common because photographers, we have all these direct experiences with the situation or with wildlife. So they'll interview me either as a direct interview or just to get more information to write their story. Okay, so yeah. you give them the photos plus ideas. And exactly, then they work with it. yeah. So many of the animals that you photographed are endangered. Yeah. And I think there's a pretty good awareness of how climate change is endangering those animals, especially, you know, polar bears, etc. Yeah. But uh, habitat loss and invasive species and other encroachments because of the huge monoculture it seems like it's equally threatening. And I wonder if that's an angle that you're trying to approach. Definitely. I mean, habitat loss for so many of the animals that I showed, you know, orangutans are like the extreme example for it. But habitat loss is, is something that can affect, that is affecting, I think, every endangered species that you saw photos of. It's something that's very challenging to capture in an image. Um, you know, we, we do see images of it, but um, it's difficult to, to visually capture that. You know, the biggest thing in Africa is, um, you know, areas that have been just grazed and they're deserts essentially because of so many years of um, improper grazing. There's, and then prey loss is as bad as habitat loss, if not worse, particularly obviously for the predators. But the prey loss is, is huge when you are working in impoverished countries. Basically, outside the national park, you don't see many things alive. Um, so again, I think there's so many, um, a lot of people when the, the death penalty was 
recently announced by Kenya for poachers. People were gonna get the death penalty for poaching and I had so many friends on Facebook celebrating this. And to me, it is a terribly tragic, sad, sad situation um, because most of these poachers that are doing the poaching, they're low on the scale. You've got the person above them and then a middleman and then usually someone in the government that's getting all the money. Those aren't the people that are gonna get executed, it's the guy at the bottom. Um, and, and so it's not necessarily like the photos you saw today aren't like guy going to get meat and give it to his children. It's much more commercial than that. It's like a drug trade, it's big. But he's a very, very poor man who does not have many opportunities, if any, besides poaching for making money. So it's very easy for all of us to see it as black and white in this country. Uh, what, can, where, what should Google be doing beyond what they are doing? In the, in the realm of conservation. That's a really good and, question. And, and Maybe you of... should tell me that. <laughs> it's secret. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say in the realm of, of conservation and of uh, arts education for kids and women. You know, I think anything that corporations... First of all, the, one of the things that I... So I do so much with kids between my children's magazines, the children's books, the girls who click, and to me... The biggest problem in, in our society is disconnection with nature. I mean, it is, it is so shockingly present and, and such a serious issue because it touches on local issues and global. If a kid's not connected to nature here, they're not going to care about lions in Africa. Um, so I think that just establishing a strong connection to nature from the youngest age possible is so critical. I, I work in, I have a print shop. I sell photos to children's hospitals and to moms. I purposely have an economical line of prints so that moms on low budgets can afford to buy my work because I believe it's important for those photos to be on the nursery wall for kids to see them on the wall because honestly, I'm not sure those kids are gonna be taken anywhere where they're gonna see birds and squirrels let alone larger animals than that. So I think that anything that corporations can do to, to get kids outside and to get them connected to nature is, is, um, is really, really important in the most basic level. Because I think with our conservation, yes, and fundraising is really important and working with adults is really important, but so much of it is, is we're preaching to the choir because we're reaching people who already care. The, the biggest thing, and, and I, it boggles my mind because so many huge conservation organizations do nothing with children anywhere in the world, and that we're just totally missing the boat. All I have to do is look at young kids on their iPads and how much time they spend a day outside with their feet touching the ground. For many children, it's zero. I think, I mean, I don't know the actual numbers, but I think for the majority of children, it might be zero. So I, I think that is the biggest threat in this country right now, is that, that connection being gone. I can't imagine my childhood without nature. It was such a part of it. And I just lived in the hills in San Rafael. I didn't live anywhere exotic. So um, in terms of what else Google can do, I think I'll leave that to you to, to figure out. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.